Good morning, Kensington, Birmingham. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you that you give us a higher purpose to love others the way that you love us. I pray, Lord, that we would see people the way you see them, the way you see us. And I pray that that would change our hearts to make a community. I pray that we would remain unchanged this morning. In Jesus' name.
That was beautiful, everyone. Can you turn to someone and make them feel welcome? Maybe ask them if their power's on? Kensington. My name is Taylor Leal and I am one of the kids directors at our Troy campus. If this is your first time hanging out with us, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. One of the things we value here at Kensington is the next generation. You see it in the way that we staff our programs, the way that we invite adults to lead and mentor our students, and honestly, you might even see it from the colors we choose to use in kids ministry. Wait, what? That's right. You just might see orange in some of the things that we do. Why orange, maybe you're asking? I'm so glad you asked. Orange is made up of two colors, yellow and red. 
We believe that yellow stands for Jesus, the light of the world and the church. And red, well, red stands for you. It stands for the love and the passion of the family. And we believe that those two combined forces are better than just one. Plain and simple, we are just better together. We believe that we can work together to create a lasting faith in this next generation. In fact, you see it in the kids' events we promote, and most importantly, you see it on a Sunday morning here at church. Every Sunday, your child gets to experience community time with their friends, worship where they are free to sing and dance and be themselves. They hear a story from the Bible that ends with an action step and how they can apply God's story to their everyday life. And it doesn't end there. Every week, we have an army of leaders that show up and lead groups of our friends and K-Kids. They do crafts, they sing silly songs, and they talk about what's going on in their life. Maybe don't tell anyone I told you this, but serving on the K-Kids team is probably one of the best teams here at Kensington. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> so if you're looking for a fun way to lead and empower the next generation, come and talk to us. But the fun doesn't end on Sunday. If you have a child in K-Kids, go ahead and get your phone out right now. And I want to encourage you to download the Parent Q app. This app is a tool that I use weekly with my own kids. It provides the video message from Sunday, and it also gives prompts throughout the week on ways you can engage your little one in conversations that tie right back into what they learned on Sunday. So what are you waiting for? You can also catch us on Instagram and Facebook with the handle at Kensington Church Kids. We hope to see you and your families real soon, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the service. Well, hey, welcome to Kensington. How are you all doing today? Good. I want to welcome our friends that are online as well. We're so glad that you're tuning in. If you don't know, this is the Birmingham campus, and we're so excited you are here with us today. Uh, my name is Justin. I get to lead this campus and be a part of the team here. And can we give it up to the worship team that led us earlier? They were absolutely incredible, right? I just... I. I'm constantly encouraged by the incredible people who uh, step out of the seats and serve on the team. Like I remember so many of the different stories that sit up here, people just like you and me, well, maybe they have better voices than me, um, but they have talents that are hidden. And that's one of the things I would just say this in Kensington, there are so many hidden talents that are around our community. And, and we love to see those unlocked. One of the ways that you get to do that is through serving. Uh, you heard uh, Taylor speak about Kensington kids. I served in there for many years. It was a blast, especially as a parent. I'd encourage you to check out some of those serving opportunities. You can also see on the screen, there's a way to take a step or in the lobby at the hub. If you have questions, you want to talk to somebody, do that. I'd encourage you to do that. Now, uh, uh, before I, I kind of talk a little bit about today and another opportunity, I want to know who lost power. Can we get some, uh, oh, my people. Who still doesn't have power? Come on now. You are my people. You are my people. Don't worry. They told me it would be back on Friday. Uh, so we're looking at a good time. Um, but uh, one of the things that I just love about this community is the way that people reach out, try to encourage each other, neighbors. That actually fits a little bit with what we're going to talk about. But one of the things that that's forged in is relationship. And for you men, I want to give you an opportunity to take a step. Uh, next weekend, we have something called uh, Iron Sharpens Iron. It's a men's conference that we're hosting at our Clinton Township campus. We'd love for you to consider joining me and some others. Uh, we have this uh, retreat in the fall that we call Man Camp. And we've always talked about what would it look like for us to offer a one-day experience, and so our team of our Clinton Township men created this. We'd love to, for you to join. You can sign up online to do that, but it's a way to build relationship and also just dive deeper, uh, which is, especially in the chaos of our every single day, it's a great opportunity to do that. Would encourage you to do that with us. Now, today we are in our second week of a series called Seeing Clearly, and we talked last week about the idea for us to see clearly, it changes everything. When you can see clearly, it changes everything. And we talked about how seeing Jesus clearly changes how we look at everything else. How we look at ourselves, how we look at people, how we look at our purpose. And that's what today is about. We're talking about our purpose. Now, what I'm really glad uh, to share with you is this topic today comes from a conversation that our staff team was having. We started talking about what does it look like uh, for us to have maybe some values, some core things that are true of our community. And one of those core values is what we're talking about today. What does it mean for us to see our purpose clearly? And uh, as we were talking about it, Tatiana, who helps lead our worship and arts team, uh, 
shared this word in the middle of our meeting and all of us just kind of paused and we're like, that's it. That is something that every single purpose, a person, when they discover their purpose, can experience. And, and so I'm really excited to have Tatiana lead us today. If you don't know Tatiana, she's our worship and arts pastor. But we are celebrating her one year of being here on our team. And she has brought incredible goodwill. So uh, as she leads us today, to, I, I am so grateful for her. Uh, make sure you are listening to everything she is saying because it's powerful. And she led this into our team, and, and I cannot wait. Happy one year, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I can't believe it's been a year here. It was literally colder last March when we got here than today. Did you see it's going to be 60 degrees almost next Monday? Is anyone excited for that? Woohoo! Yeah, that's awesome. Well, like Justin said, my name is Tatiana. I lead worship here at the Kensington Birmingham campus, and I feel so honored to be here this morning with you all and to be a part of this series that we are in as a campus about seeing clearly that, like Justin said, this is about when we see God clearly, it leads to us seeing everything else in our lives differently. But right now, I'm going to invite our team forward, and they are going to take our offering if you choose to partner with us financially, we are so thankful for your generosity. That is what enables us as a church to move out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in our local communities and globally as well and bless our communities locally and bless this world with the love of Jesus. So thank you so much for your continued generosity. We really appreciate it. Well, today we're going to be talking about what it means for us to see our purpose as the church clearly, both communally and as individuals living out the way of Jesus wherever we go. And as we do, like Justin was talking about, there's a word that our Birmingham staff has latched onto as we think about our purpose, and that word is sanctuary. Sanctuary. And the word sanctuary is really interesting because it has these religious roots and spiritual connotations to it, but it's also a word that we use in our world to describe any place of refuge or safety. You've probably heard of bird, marine life, wildlife, and I'm sure, of course, that you've heard of cat sanctuaries that are all over the world. <laughs> and these sanctuaries are set up to provide peace, safety, preserve the life and well-being of these creatures, and so they've been deemed animal sanctuaries. And my husband told me this morning that I probably shouldn't talk about my cat again. So I won't talk about how my home is a sanctuary for my cat, but I will share an updated photo of her with you all. She is also enjoying the sunshine, as you can see. It kind of moves down the steps during the day, and she will move down the steps during the day and sit in the sunshine. It's very sweet. But we also have national parks that some of them can be referred to as sanctuaries, but they're also just areas that are protected. They protect the natural habitat that preserves the beauty that we get to enjoy. In these spaces, pollution is monitored so we can see the stars clearly, the water is clean and bright and beautiful. These areas of nature are protected and preserved, and because of that, you could consider them sanctuaries for nature. These are some of the most beautiful places in our world, and they are protected to maintain that beauty so that we get to go out and see them and enjoy and stand in awe of God's creation. How many of us here have actually been to Michigan's National Park, Isle Royale? Has anybody? Oh, awesome. It is way out there. What about one of our national lake shores, Sleeping Bear Dunes or Pictured Rocks? Oh, now it's almost everybody. That's awesome. We got to go to Pictured Rocks in September. It was beautiful. But these places are a little taste of heaven on earth. When you go there, it's absolutely beautiful. You see the water, it's clean and clear and bright. And when you see people exploring, I feel like you can notice how much they care to pick up their trash and leave that space the same and take care of it. In another sense, cities, countries, and states can also declare sanctuary status when they seek to provide refuge for immigrants and refugees instead of persecution. And these places become sanctuaries because they commit to the protection and well-being of a person to keep them safe, at peace, and taken care of. So we see here in our world that the word sanctuary has kind of taken on a different meaning, that even though we may think of it immediately as a church sanctuary and it has these religious roots and spiritual connotations, it's broadened in our society to mean a place of refuge or safety. And I've been wondering if that is what sanctuary was supposed to mean all along and if that is what the church was supposed to be all along. 
Because it's clear that every part of creation is looking for a place to take sanctuary. Plants, animals, the stars, and people. And we look everywhere to find that place of refuge and sanctuary. And this is the purpose that the church is meant to provide. We are meant to be a sanctuary for people to find refuge, care, safety, and belonging, not simply in a building, but that we as the people of God would be walking, living, breathing sanctuaries so that whoever we interact with experiences the love of Jesus through us. And in the life of Jesus, we see him be this for people. We see him be a sanctuary for people. We see how he welcomed his disciples, how he included them. How he gave them belonging, purpose, love, and community. And we see that he modeled this for them so that then they would do the same for others. Because to be a sanctuary as followers of Jesus is to follow the way of Jesus. To make room for others to be included, welcomed, cared for, and given a place to belong so that they would experience God in a way that leads to life transformation. Because when we belong with Jesus, we become like Jesus. So this morning, we're going to be looking at an interaction between Jesus and his disciples when Jesus performed one of his most well-known miracles and how Jesus then led his disciples to provide a place of sanctuary for the people around them and how they continued to then live out this value in the days of the early church. But first, let's talk about who the disciples were. So we know that Matthew and Levi were tax collectors, and they were understandably disliked for the way that they took advantage of others to make a profit for themselves. In this time, tax collectors were hated, despised, rejected, outcast, but Jesus took the time to not only be with them, but to invite them into his circle of disciples and give them a place to belong, despite their social standing and their messy behavior. And we know, too, that many of the disciples were also fishermen, and this is on the other side of that spectrum. Fishermen were hardworking, skilled people, kind of like a typical laid-back, blue-collar worker that we'd see today. And then later on, the book of Colossians mentions that another disciple, Luke, was a doctor. So we have all of these different people from all of these different walks of life. And we know that Jesus' following didn't just include the 12 disciples, but that there were many other women who were close friends of Jesus and followed him from town to town, and they were also included and welcomed into his ministry. And the Gospel of Luke talks about how these women provided for Jesus' ministry out of their own resources. And a few of them were Mary Magdalene, Susanna, Joanna, Mary, and Martha. But there were also a lot of un- other unnamed men and women who were included. And Jesus' inclusion of people of diverse backgrounds and life experiences shows us the beauty and expansiveness of the kingdom of God. Some of them maybe would have been looked over, deemed too ordinary, too disreputable, but Jesus welcomed them anyways. And I think it's significant that Jesus didn't go looking for the CEOs of that day who could get him ahead. The people who would be considered most impressive and extraordinary, maybe the Mark Cubans of that day, who could really help him build a brand and get his name out there. But Jesus instead sought out the ordinary people of all backgrounds and places in society and invited them into the kingdom of God and gave them authority to do miracles, taught them the way of his kingdom and what it looked like to really love God and love people. And then it's, of course, significant and countercultural as well that Jesus welcomed and included these women, too, in revolutionary ways. Luke says that when Jesus traveled, the twelve were with him, along with certain women and many others. And then tells us that Mary sat at the Lord's feet, and sat at the Lord's feet was an expression used to describe the disciple of a Jewish rabbi. So women provided financial support. They were invited to sit under his teaching. They were included and treated as equals in ways that they had never been before in that time. Because Jesus' followers were all given the opportunity to contribute to and experience the kingdom of God. And the thing is, these people were given a gift. They were given the gift of close proximity to Jesus. They got to experience God through the revelation of Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. And this is good news for all people worth inviting others into and sharing with them. 
And this concept of close proximity to Jesus is something that we're going to be looking at a lot today in regards to what it means for us to live in this closeness to God, but also make sure that we, as a people of God, are creating spaces and living as people who invite others into that closeness to experience and get to know who Jesus is as well, because when we belong with Jesus, we become like Jesus. So the story that we're going to be looking at today is a story where Jesus teaches his followers what it looks like to not only welcome, but see others differently. A crowd comes to see Jesus and has some physical and spiritual needs that Jesus is taking care of, and Jesus looks at the crowd quite differently than his disciples do. And rather than rebuking his disciples for their immediate response to the needs of the crowd, he invites them in and he teaches them how to see them differently and how to be a sanctuary. So let's jump into the story. As soon as Jesus heard the news, and this news was about the death of his cousin, John the Baptist, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowds as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So the first thing for us to notice here is how Jesus saw the crowd. It says that he saw them and had compassion on them. These people who heard about his arrival, it says that they came on foot from many towns. So who knows how tired their feet were from walking, how thirsty they were from the travel. They were desperate to see Jesus. And even though he was likely emotionally exhausted as well from the grief of losing someone that he loved and maybe wanted to be alone, his compassion wasn't simply a feeling, but it led him to action as he moved towards them and he healed their sick. And how often do you see someone the way that Jesus saw these people? How often do you see someone sick and in need and instead of drawing away, you move towards them? Now, personally, I am a major germaphobe. I hate being sick. So if I'm talking to someone who is sick, you will see me visibly try to take a step back to make sure that I don't get infected and get sick because I hate it. And I was sick this last week. And the thing is, I'm just bad at being sick. I don't know if you feel like that too, but I'm bad at it. Even if I have a slight cough, I become completely useless. Everyone around me will know that I'm sick, not because I'm coughing or sniffling, but because I complain a lot. Everyone knows that I'm sick because I don't suffer well when I'm sick. I become totally useless and I'll look at my husband and just say, I'm thirsty. And then he'll get up and get me water. It's amazing. But if you talk to him afterwards, he'll tell you that regardless of if I'm sick or not, I still do that and he still gets up and gets me water. (laughs) So when I think about the way that Jesus, not like me, took a step back, but actually took a step in towards these people who were sick, that's pretty unbelievably beautiful. And in this culture, too, depending on the sickness, you were considered unclean. So you would be avoided and unwelcome by others, depending on what that sickness looked like. But Jesus did not avoid. He didn't take a step back. He moved towards people. He took a step in, and he showed them that they were welcome and gave them space to experience the healing power of God. These people who likely would not have experienced welcome in another setting But in the presence of Jesus, they found welcome, they found healing, they found a place to take sanctuary. And I love to think, too, of the people who brought that sick person that they loved to Jesus, who walked all that way with them from many towns. And maybe we're thinking on that journey, maybe they'll be able to find healing here with this person. And then the story continues with the disciples' response. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. And I think it's interesting here that the disciples came to Jesus with a list of reasons why these people should be sent away. It was a remote place. It was getting late. The crowds need to go buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. Sending them away was not necessary. Because Jesus was inviting his disciples to see the crowd the way he did, with compassion leading to action. He invited them to be active participants in this miracle. Rather than sending the people away so that they could deal with their needs on their own, Jesus was inviting them to take a step in and move towards people to take care of their needs so that they didn't have to go away. 
but they could remain in the presence of Jesus and continue to learn from him because they have their spiritual and physical needs taken care of. Because belonging with Jesus leads to becoming like Jesus. And this is that concept of close proximity to Jesus that we see here in this story. What does it look like for us to both live in this closeness to God and make sure that we are living as people who invite others into that closeness to experience God and get to know who Jesus is as well? Well, Jesus teaches his disciples what that looks like next. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass and Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Do you notice how Jesus helped his disciples' perspectives to shift through their participation in this miracle? Jesus invited his disciples to be active participants because they got to be the ones distributing the food to the people. And we're actually going to do that together this morning. We have some food to distribute and what I would say is the modern equivalent of two fish and five loaves of bread, which you might be thinking, I think that the modern equivalent of loaves and fish is still loaves and fish. But... Today it is bread is a granola bar and fish is Swedish fish because it would have been kind of gross to bring fish into a building and hand it out. <laughs> so just picture for a moment that the disciples are going out into the crowd, these people that they were before seeing at a distance. They are now walking up to them and handing them food. They're looking them in the eyes. They're seeing the sick person that they loved and brought all this way to Jesus and maybe hearing their story and why they were so desperate for healing. Here's a granola bar. You know, maybe they're sharing some laughs with some people. Maybe someone says, actually, bread and fish, do you have anything gluten-free or vegetarian available? <laughs> Which that would have been me. I would have been the one asking for that as a gluten-free vegetarian. But just think for a moment how these disciples were looking at these people from a distance for a while. And then Jesus sends them out to go have real conversations, to really look people in the eyes in this moment. And I think that when we do that, we see the humanity in people. Someone that maybe was a concept or an idea in our mind then becomes a real person with real needs that we begin to understand. And when we see them that way, the way God does, he changes us. The love that God has for that person, that child of his, is formed in our hearts, and we love them too. So try to imagine this for a moment. The sick and needy, spiritually and physically, they're all gathered. They came from a long journey feeling hungry and tired, and one by one, the disciples are looking at them in the eyes. They're handing them food. Do you think they saw differently in that moment? Do you think they saw their humanity, the image of God in them? The gratitude on their face when they realized that they were going to be fed and they didn't have to go away to figure out their food situation. They could stay in the presence of Jesus. I wonder how those little encounters with people changed the disciples and how they saw people after that day. I wonder how it changed them from that day forward. Because not only did these people get to remain in close proximity to Jesus, but Jesus invited his disciples to live in close proximity to the people that he loved. And this is living out the way of Jesus. This is the way of his kingdom. A pastor and author, John Ortberg, calls this bringing up there down here. Bringing the kingdom of heaven and the way of Jesus to earth and living it out. And in this act, Jesus invited his disciples to see people the way that he did, with compassion leading to action. Rather than sending people away to deal with their needs on their own, they instead moved towards them to take care of their needs, ensuring that they didn't have to go away but could remain in the presence of Jesus and continue to learn from him. They could have a place to belong. And at first, the disciples' focus was on the lack 
that they only had five loaves of bread and two fish. So I wonder if they were thinking that there wouldn't be enough for them if they shared with everybody else. I wonder if they thought that that amount of food could have taken care of their group of 12 or so, but to extend beyond that would have meant none or less for them. And that's a natural feeling to have, to want our physical and spiritual and emotional needs taken care of. And I even wonder if it felt like there wasn't enough of Jesus to go around and that the crowd was taking up the time alone with him that they really wanted. But the way that Jesus shifts their perspective through this miracle is so powerful because he demonstrates in this feeding of 5,000 plus people that the generosity that we have received from God is meant to lead us to be generous to others in every way with our food, with our time, with our resources, our love and patience and compassion. Freely we've received, Jesus told us, now we freely give. And the crowds and Jesus' followers were given a sanctuary in this moment. They were given a place of safety, belonging, refuge from their struggles, healing, and most of all, proximity to Jesus that led to transformation because when we belong with Jesus, we become like Jesus. Because of the way this miracle provided for their physical needs, they were able to remain in this close proximity to Jesus, not having to be sent away on their own. And later on in the book of Acts, we can see how differently the disciples approach the needs of others since this day. And I feel like when you read this passage, you can see the mark that this day had on them and how it changed them. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and a fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then two chapters later it says, there were no needy persons among them. There were no needy persons among them. They ate together. They gave up what they had in order to give to those in need, and God blessed it. In the early days of the church, the name that was given to people in the Jesus community was followers of the way, because they lived their lives the way that Jesus did. And in this, I can't help but see how the disciples followed the way that Jesus modeled for them after this miracle. Instead of holding on tightly to, to their possessions or even keeping their group closed off, they were open-handed and generous and welcoming. Their proximity to Jesus led to them becoming like Jesus because they noticed and saw the needs of people and responded with compassion and generosity. They became living, breathing, walking sanctuaries for others the way that Jesus was for them. And you know, I think that there are many places in this world that have been intended to be sanctuaries that end up being broken in some way and can even lose their sanctuary status. Some animal sanctuaries have ended up being more about profit than a true place of rescue and refuge for wildlife. Even sanctuary cities in those refugees can still be met with bigotry, hatred, and struggle to get their needs met, struggle to adjust to life. And then sometimes, sadly, the church can fail to be true sanctuaries for people by making this community more about thinking the right things, believing the right things, behaving the right way, and then, then you can be welcomed, rather than taking a journey with people towards the person of Jesus. Like the disciples on that day, sometimes those of us on the inside are more focused on our needs being met, and unintentionally or sadly even sometimes intentionally, we end up sending people away. We send people away from experiencing close proximity to Jesus in this space and in our lives. And I know that I have done this before. And it breaks my heart that I have done this to people before. But like Jesus modeled close proximity with the people present at this miracle, it is being in relationship and close proximity with people with different lived experiences than we have that change our perspective and enable us to love better and create a place that would truly be a refuge, a sanctuary for them, both in a building and in relationship. Because when we show people that they belong with us, we show them they belong with Jesus. 
Now, my first boss ever was a man named Burl, and I think we have a photo of Burl to show you, his sweet, smiling face. He really was world's best boss. Well, Burl, uh, he hired me when I was 19 years old into ministry. So when people ask me why I'm in ministry today, how I got into ministry, I say it is because of this man. Because I don't know about you, would you have hired yourself at 19 years old? (laughs) I wouldn't have hired myself at 19 years old, but Burl did because Burl advocated for me and really believed in raising up young leaders, investing in them and raising up the next generation in the church. Now, Burl was gentle and patient with me as I made a ton of mistakes. He helped me grow as a leader and a pastor. And what I'm most thankful for about Burl, though, is the way my friendship with him expanded my worldview. Burl was very open with me and the rest of our staff about the racism that he experienced his whole life as a black man. And even, sadly, the the racism that he still experienced to that day in the church. And hearing his stories and experiences was shocking to me. I heard things that I wished weren't true. Things that challenged me and made me feel uncomfortable to accept that this was a reality in his life. Because at that time, I just wanted to believe that that kind of racism just didn't happen anymore, that we had had that figured out. But he shared how hurtful it was when well-meaning people claimed that they were colorblind, because then it meant to him that they didn't want to see or acknowledge his experiences, the painful parts of his experiences as a black man in this world. And he often lamented about how sometimes he would open up to people about this pain that he was experiencing, and he would be met with people minimizing his pain and just failing to simply believe that he was hurt. But I realized because of close proximity to him that to be a sanctuary for people of color meant that I needed to listen, learn from, and begin to understand their lived experiences of racism, prejudice, microaggressions, and speak out against those injustices. And another friend of mine at her workplace, they had a gathering of all of the black women on staff and brought in a guest speaker named Lisa Nichols. And she led them through an exercise of sharing their lived experiences with one another, and they were told to respond to each woman who shared with these three phrases. I see you, I hear you, I believe you. I see you, I hear you, I believe you. Isn't that powerful? Because this is what we should be doing as a church and what our response to be should be to people who have experienced prejudice of any kind. That we see them the way that Jesus sees them, with compassion leading to action. That we hear them and truly listen to them with the intent to understand and we believe them. We don't minimize their pain or justify it or make excuses, but we just believe them and sit with them in it. That we weep with those who weep. When Jesus sends his disciples into the crowd, this is what he's teaching them to do. To see, hear, believe people, to sit with them. Then recently, another friend of Timmy and I has told us about their recent diagnosis with autism. And they got this diagnosis pretty late in life, in their 30s. And to get diagnosed with autism that late into adulthood has been a lot for them to process. It's given reason and language for things that they've dealt with their whole life and didn't understand. But at the same time, they've realized how much energy has gone into masking and denying what they need to feel safe, comfortable, and accommodated for. And he shared with us how he's learned over this last year that autism isn't a disease, an illness, or a disorder, but it's just a way that his brain is wired differently. But because of that, and how our society and even our churches are just not built for autistic people, he feels broken. He feels broken because of how hard he has to work to fit in to normal life. And this is one of Timmy and I's very best friends. We love him so much. It is so important to us that we are a sanctuary for him. That if there are two people that he can spend time with and feel like he doesn't have to mask for, which is a term for autistic folks feeling like they need to cover up their autism to fit in, I want to be the two people that he can let his mask down with, that he can be comfortable and be himself with. He's been so patient with us as he's taught us how to love better. And we as the church are meant to be a people of refuge and create a place of refuge that people are searching for. 
And this is what a sanctuary is, a sanctuary of racial reconciliation and healing, a sanctuary for victims of abuse to find support, help, and belief. A sanctuary for people with mental illness or chronic pain to find people who are gentle and understanding with their struggles. A sanctuary for neurodivergent folks with autism or ADHD to find people who are patient with their needs. A, a sanctuary for people with disabilities to be seen and treated with dignity and love that we would see the needs of others and consider them as more important than their own and listen to their experiences with compassion. So whoever God has put in your life with a different lived experience than you, I wonder how God might be calling you this morning to learn how to be a sanctuary for them. And in doing so, that you would give them space to experience closeness to Jesus through the love and welcome that you show them. Because when we show someone that they belong with us, we're showing them they belong with Jesus. And belonging with Jesus leads to becoming like Jesus. And when we do this for people, we do this for Jesus. Jesus told us that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is just like it, to love our neighbor. So to love God is to love our neighbor, and to love our neighbor is to express our love for God. Jesus said in Matthew 25, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you were naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. When was it that we saw? When we see others and see them truly the way that Jesus saw the crowds that day with compassion and move towards them the way Jesus did with action, it is like we are caring for Jesus himself. And that is how we see our purpose as a church most clearly, when we learn to see the way that Jesus sees, because to see others and to love them is to love God. To see the image of God and inherent worth in others is to see God clearly. To make a space where people are welcome in our homes, in our lives, in our church is making Jesus welcome too. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, he comes in the form of the beggar, of the dissolute human child in ragged clothes asking for help. He confronts you and every person that you meet. As long as there are people, Christ will walk the earth as your neighbor. He confronts you and every person that you meet. He invites us to see and embrace our purpose as a church. So this morning, maybe you need to know that you are seen here. Maybe you need to know that this space can be a sanctuary for who you are, whatever it is that you're carrying, wherever you're at in your faith journey, regardless of if or what you believe. I want to say too that our leadership here is committed to making this space exactly that. We want Kensington, Birmingham to be a place that you can take sanctuary. We want to be a people you can take sanctuary in. Because God is calling each one of us to go out into this world with his eyes for people, eyes that see with compassion that moves us to action. And Jesus is inviting us to do what his disciples did that day, passing out food, to be in close proximity with the people he loves and invite them to then be in close proximity with the God who loves them. Because belonging with Jesus leads to becoming like Jesus. So I wanna encourage you to consider this morning, who is Jesus asking you to see? Who is someone in your life with a different lived experience than you have that you can listen to, that you can seek to understand their story and treat them with compassion and be a place of comfort and safety for them to share with? And perhaps you need to consider what needs of yours you might be holding on to that would prevent people from experiencing close proximity to Jesus like the disciples had to do too. Whatever it looks like for you to begin seeing your purpose as the church clearly, 
being a sanctuary that enables people to experience close proximity to Jesus through your love and welcome. I'm sure there's a person, there's a name who has come to mind for you, and there's a reason that they've been standing out to you. So take some time to talk to God about this person, about this community, and ask him how he would have you be a place of welcome and how he would have you love them well and lead them towards the person of Jesus who loves them so much. So as we close, I want to invite us to pray one of my favorite prayers, known as the prayer of St. Francis. And I think that this prayer captures so beautifully what it means for us to be sanctuaries of God's love. So let's pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. And when there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
Wow. Give it up for them one more time. That was incredible. One of the things that Tatiana shared that I, I just is sticking with me is that statement, when we belong with Jesus, we become like Jesus. And this is the thing I couldn't stop thinking about as she was talking about the idea of sanctuary. There is somebody in your life who is a sanctuary for you. There was somebody who gave you time, who saw something in you, who believed in you. And you are forever grateful for that person. I know it because I have, I can list them, Brian and Robin, Brian Buck, my soccer coach, Adrian. Like there are people we come across that are sanctuaries for us. I think of you middle school and high school students. Like ask your parents, who is the sanctuary in their life? And you might find a story of a person who gave them time when they needed it. And maybe to you, you're, the question you wonder, who's the sanctuary in my life right now? Who can I go to? Because I love this, this one line that Tatiana shared that just struck me, is because what Jesus was teaching the disciples, and I think he's teaching us, is that when we're given the gift of close proximity to God, we get to experience him in a holy way. So my hope for you is you're thinking about what does it mean to be a sanctuary as you think about that person that was that for you and it challenges you, invites you to be that for others. Amen? Can you give it up for Tatiana leading us today and bringing her heart? By the way, I would say if you're new or you got questions about how to get connected, stop by in the lobby at the Hub. Uh, Brian's out there. He's awesome. He'll be a sanctuary for you out there. And uh, connect with him, and uh, we will see you back here next week. God bless you, and have a great week. Mm -hmm.